първи на сцената днес ще изгледа Пол Зенън. А, той е един от, може би, най-известните британски комедианти, а, иллюзионисти и има няколко стотин участия в телевизионни предавания, изяви пред публика и въобще това тук определено не му е първото. А, той а, дълго време се занимавал с а, магически трикове иллюзии, но това, за което ще говори днес, е как същите тези иллюзии се използват от а, врачки, медиуми, баячки и разни други хора, които се опитват да ви вземат парите. И ще поканя при мен Пол. You can come on stage now. We are done. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon. How are we doing then? Okay? Oh, well, that's good. Great. As uh, you just heard, my name is Paul Zenon. I have to say, um, out of that whole introduction there, um, both by Vasi and Lubo there, I probably understood three words. I think I understood Twitter, Facebook, and BBC. That was it, so I have no idea who you think I am. Um, what I'll do is I'll tell you a little bit. First of all, apologize for the fact that I'm speaking in your country in English. As you probably know, English people are not too good at other languages. But then we live in England, so it's usually not a problem. Um, basically, what I'm going to be talking about is, uh, as you can see, they're the secrets of the psychics. But I thought, first of all, it would make sense for me to tell you uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, if there's anything that uh, you want to stop me, if you don't understand, uh, just shout, stop, English boy, and I'll repeat and uh, try and explain, okay? Um, so, first of all, I, um, I was brought up in a, a place in the northwest of England, on the coast, a seaside town called Blackpool. Uh, this is Blackpool. Um, it's kind of a working-class resort. It's kind of like um, sunny beach without the sunshine. Okay, it's where drunken English people go on holiday, basically. Um, and uh, there's not much there. There's kind of three piers, uh, like boardwalks and a fun fair. And also, the main thing it's famous for is the tower and electricity. Um, it, basically, what they do every year, they have these things called the illuminations, which is 10 kilometers of light bulbs. It's a bit like in here, actually. And uh, people go to look at the light bulbs. That's how low rent Blackpool is. Light bulbs are exciting there. Uh, but when, it was, uh, when I was a kid, I kind of, you know, I was born in the 60s. Hard to believe, I know. Uh, but Blackpool was an incredibly popular place. This is the beach in Blackpool, even without sunshine, okay, in the 1960s. And it's basically what happened there. I got a summer job when I was a kid, and I used to work in a magic shop. And I used to learn to do magic and sell tricks, do card tricks and things like that, and also jokes, like practical jokes, so jokes and magic. And uh, I got to know a lot of people there, some interesting people, because everybody in Blackpool was basically there to rip off tourists. The whole idea was to get money however you could out of tourists, whether it was by pickpocketing, selling something, doing a magic trick, whatever it may be. And so some of the characters I met were quite dark and quite dodgy. And uh, I met a lot of people. One of the really popular things for English people on holiday is to get their fortune told. So they go and see um, like a, a gypsy palmist, a Romany palmist. I think we've got, have we got a picture of one there. Um, have we not? Soon, it's, oh, it's the spirits are interfering already. Anyway, people would, um, people would um, go and get their palm read, and oh, that's interesting. This, this, that, <laughs> that's obviously the wrong switch we hit there. I think okay. And uh, they'd go get their palm read, and uh, these people would, they weren't usually from a gypsy background, but because they would, uh, they would pretend to be, because being a gypsy in Blackpool was quite exotic. Um, and I, oh, there we go. And so there's little caravans, and girls were going to get their fortune told, and I got to know someone called Gypsy Angelina Petulengro, whose real name was Pat Smith. Uh, I swear, it's true. And, uh, and I learned to do palm reading and tarot reading, you know, reading the tarot cards. And I kind of learned to do it kind of properly. I learned what the cards meant and what the lines meant on your hand. But also, from all the magicians that I got to know through the magic shop, I learned about the applied psychology and how to tell fortunes. And so I started doing this together with the magic for a living. Now, when I was 19 years old, I, I traveled to Greece. I went to Greece for six months, and I traveled around the Greek islands. That's, that's me uh, there uh, with a very... With a, an audience that are looking about as bored as you are now, actually. 
Uh, and I used to do street shows around the Greek islands, but there are a lot of places where the police wouldn't let you do street shows. And so instead, I'd set up in a bar and I'd read the, the palms and tarot cards from tourists, uh, you know, which is very easy if you're reading palms on a Greek island for British tourists, you know? It's kind of, I can see you maybe traveling over water. Things like that, yeah. And um, so uh, you, may, you may be eating something involving an olive. Things like that. So it's very easy. But the way it worked, um, the applied psychology for fortune tellers is very easy. Because what they're doing, basically, is telling you things in general that may happen in the future. And people have a very selective memory. So what they do, they go away. If they've told them anything specific about, you know, maybe how many brothers and sisters they've got, you know, whether they've got a cat or a dog at home, they always remember that bit. People don't remember all the things that weren't true because they're actually only interested in themselves and what applies to them. So years after seeing a fortune teller, you might go away and say, he told me something he couldn't possibly have known, but you've forgotten the 50 things that didn't apply, you know? <laughs> That's the way it works. And um, so, you know, I can of did a bit of fortune telling. What they're also doing is a thing I'll talk about a little bit later called cold reading. Now, uh, cold reading is basically where you tell people things that are general things uh, that apply to anyone but sound quite specific to an individual, but depending on their reaction, uh, then you kind of home in. Now, it's interesting, if someone goes to see a psychic or a fortune teller, usually they'll go to see them about one of three areas. The first area is about uh, wealth and career. Are they going to make any money? Will they get the new job? The second thing is about relationships and love. You know, will I get married? How many children am I might have? The third thing is generally about health. Is someone in my family going to die of a heart attack? Will I live a long life? Things like that. Now, once you say these things to a person, by their body language, you know, sometimes it's kind of defensive, like this lady here at the front, where the legs are crossed and the arms are folded, you know that they're really not buying into it. But if they suddenly lean forward, or nod and smile, or maybe use the hand or something, you can tell their interest. So you kind of home in. But we'll talk about more about cold reading later. But I kind of learned the trade, age 19, 20 years old, uh, in Greece, and basically, uh, a couple of things eventually stopped me doing it. And one of them was the fact that I had a couple of lucky hits, which were a little bit disturbing. One of them was good financially. There was a guy that used to come in this bar, uh, an English guy, used to drive a big motorbike, lots of tattoos, a couple of scars on his leg, and he was always drunk, and he used to ride off drunk at the end of the night. So I did a reading for him and said, basically, I can see in the very near future, if you're not careful, there may be some kind of road accident. Uh, something and you know and so the next day he had a road accident just pure luck and I had a queue around the outside little block the next night because everybody thought I was brilliant I'd predicted this you know uh, so that was kind of fine uh, but then the next night very next night there was a girl came in who I think was Italian and she was with her friend and she was very obviously distraught um, she was kind of almost crying and um, she basically, I was doing a tarot card reading, and um, the way it works, you turn over the first card is this kind of general pointer card, and as luck would have it, it was the death card, okay? Now, if you know anything about tarot cards, the death card doesn't actually usually mean death. It just means a kind of major change of some kind. It can even mean a new beginning, a, a birth, or whatever. But unfortunately, she'd come to ask me, uh, a father had been taken into hospital that day with a heart attack, would he survive or would he not? Now, you try explaining to that girl when you turn over the death card, which was purely random. And so this kind of disturbed me. And I realised after doing maybe sort of six months of readings that this kind of thing affects people very deeply emotionally. It's OK when it's a bit of fun telling the fortune, you know, how many children will I have? But when it comes to something like that, where someone's, you know, really uh, seriously worried about someone in the family, it can have a, a, a devastating impact. And also, particularly um, when it involves mediums, and that's mainly what I'll be talking about today, mediums, we call it's basically people who pretend to contact the dead. Okay, and that can be a very, very dangerous thing. So we're going to be talking about that kind of thing. Um, I've basically got a bit of a thing about uh, people who make money uh, from pretending to be psychic. Because let's face it, if you really did have supernatural powers, you would use them to make money without preying on grieving people or needy people or bereaved people. Okay, so, um, you know, if, you'd, if the, people call it a gift, a supernatural gift. If it, if it is a gift, then why do you charge people money for it? And there are a lot of people that we're going to be looking at today who've made a lot of money. So I'm going to start off by, uh, you know, fortune telling has remained pretty much the same throughout the centuries. Uh, but something weird happened about 150 years ago, 160 years ago, in this little place. 
This little building is in New York State in America. It's about 300 miles from New York City, and it's called Hydesville. And there are a couple of sisters there. Uh, the the uh, family name was Fox, which is quite apt in a way. Uh, they're the Fox sisters, and they were called Margaret and Kate. Um, they, this happened when they were slightly younger than the picture, but obviously the photography wasn't a big thing in 1848. Um, so, 1848 was when a strange occurrence happened in that little house. Um, the mother downstairs, it had actually two floors, believe it or not, in that shack. The mother downstairs heard some tapping noises, some weird banging noises. And she went up to see what was going on. The two little girls fast asleep. Um, so, this carried on over a day or two. And eventually, the girls woke up, they'd had this dream, and they dreamt that a ghost had visited. Now, this is where the whole idea of ghosts communicating by rapping, and when I say rapping, I don't mean like Snoop Dogg and Eminem. Uh, I mean you know, like knocking noises. This is where it came from. So the mother worked out that she could ask the ghost questions while the girls were in bed. Sometimes they were still asleep. They'd, she'd ask the ghost questions, and they'd answer one knock for yes, two for no, and so it went on. Now, within a matter of weeks, all the neighbours were coming round, the local priest was coming round, and they discovered, by asking questions, that the ghost was a Mr Splitfoot. Now, Mr Splitfoot was a nickname for the devil at the time, and this house became famous not just in the village, but the entire state. Now, it became a, a, a weird situation where, th wherever these girls were, even if they were just sat there quietly, these noises would happen around them. They ended up going on tour. They toured uh, for the best part of 30 years, in fact. But there was a period where they made a lot of money. Bearing in mind this started in 1848, they were earning between $100 and $150 per night for demonstrating this in audiences the size of this. So this was the Fox Sisters. Now, we'll come back a little bit later then. This idea of what became known as spiritualism, this was the birth of the spiritualist church, which still exists, um, started with the Fox Sisters. Now, spiritualism kind of spread as a fashion, and it was only about six years later that other people were cashing in and making money out of it, not just doing it out of curiosity. So these guys uh, came up. There's, in fact, the, the older sister here, I should mention as well, became that kind of tour manager, and she was the one who kind of uh, sort of did the final financial deals. But these two other guys here, uh, the Davenport brothers, uh, oh sorry, this, this, what I meant to say at that point was um, seances in general. You, you understand what I mean by a seance, when people sit in the dark, they join hands and they communicate with the dead somehow, maybe ask questions, noises happen, sometimes they have musical instruments on the table which kind of rise in the air. It's generally done in the dark. As I say, this became a fashion not just in America after the Fox Sisters, but right across Europe. And it became a kind of high society thing. It was mostly rich people. Uh, bearing in mind there was no radio, obviously no TV, no cinema. When people had finished, you know, playing their party game or the two tunes that they'd learnt on a piano, they had a seance. That's what people did to kind of pass the time. But these two other guys um, uh, took advantage of this as well. These are the Davenport brothers. Now, they worked out a way of doing an in-the-dark seance, but for a huge audience, so that they could make money. And the way they did it was they were fastened up inside a cabinet. And the, if you look at the poster here, um, you can see they've got the, uh, the various musical instruments and stuff. It looks as though they just sat on stage in chairs, and the reason they're tied to the chairs is so that they can't mess about in the dark, they can't cheat, apparently. But what they actually did, if you saw them live, they had this cabinet. Now, basically, they got people from the audience to tie them up in the cabinet. Uh, then they closed the doors. The guy in the middle was a, a, a priest friend of those, Mr. Uh, Dr. Ferguson. And he'd do the whole speech about the spirits. And as soon as the doors were closed on the cabinet, all these instruments would come to life. Tambourines would fly out the top. Guitars would strum themselves. Trumpets would be blown. And then, as soon as he opened the door, there they were, still tied to their seats. Now, the interesting thing um, with the... Um, uh, with the people making money out of this, it became a kind of real boom industry. Now, the, uh, the guy that actually became sort of the symbol for the golden age of this was born right into the middle of the peak. He was born in the 1880s, and his name was Alexander. I think we've got a picture of him. Actually, let's just go back a, a bit, uh, just one slide there. This, by the way, is, is a guy who's cheating. That would have been happening in the dark. Um, some of the things that mediums did in those days to cheat, uh, for example, were, um, say, for example, their arms were tied uh, to the arms of the chair so that they couldn't move. In the dark, they actually had a chair with a loose arm so they could actually lift their arm up, and it came away completely with part of the chair. Um, they, they used to get people, uh, used to put their feet 
onto the feet of the, the medium so that they couldn't move theirs. Some of them had a solid steel toe cap inside their shoe that detached, so the person next to them in the dark could still feel their foot, even though their bare foot came out and could be used to move things, ring a bell with their toes, things like that. Sounds ridiculous now. Uh, this guy's using a reaching rod. Uh, now, what used to happen when people um, did the thing of joining fingers, they'd put the hands on the table and they'd make sure that the little fingers of each hand were touching each other. That way, again, in the dark, they knew that the medium couldn't be doing anything because they had both hands on the table. But what used to happen is, as the lights went down, the medium would suddenly remove one hand and when the other people actually touched fingers, they were touching the thumb rather than what they thought was the other hand's little finger. So basically the medium only had one hand on the table, the people were touching there and touching there, which gave them a free hand to do things like this. They had telescopic rods. They used to use a lot of luminous paint, like glow-in-the-dark paint. So they had things like trumpets that would, the end of it would glow, that would float around and an eerie noise would come from it. Um, the, uh, they produced ectoplasm, which we'll talk about a little bit later, because that's a weird one. Uh, but as I said, the guy that was, became famous for making money more than anybody else in the whole history of mediumship was this guy, Alexander. He's the classic look of the exotic mind reader, even though he's American. And he was known as the man who knows. His real name was Claude Alexander Conlin. And if you think that's an exaggeration, look at the next slide. He does actually look quite like that. Um, now, he was born in, uh, I think it was 1888. And uh, what uh, kind of swung him? He was a hobbyist magician. A bit like myself. I've been a professional magician for almost 30 years. He started it as a boy. Now, he got this job in a summer camp. Uh, the spiritualists used to have massive audiences, thousands and thousands of people, and it was kind of mixed with um, the Christian religion as well. So they had kind of uh, theology summer camps in America. So they'd meet by the shores of a lake, and they'd have lectures and talks, much the same situation that we're in today, but all geared around, around religion and spiritualism. Now, he had a job. This is what he actually looked like uh, before he did, did the, um, the mind-reading bit. As a young boy... He, uh, he had a job cleaning boats, and what he discovered was that in the evenings, early evenings, while he was cleaning the boats, all the people that were doing the readings, the mediums, would come and meet in the boathouse to compare notes. And what they were basically doing was giving each other information to use with their next audience, because the shows, they could only fit so many people in a tent. So some people watch a show, then the next audience would move on and fit, fill the same seats. So they go in a circuit of tents. Now, if you knew that someone with long blonde hair had an auntie called Olivia who had one leg, that's quite useful information, you know, if you get it ahead of time. So what these mediums were doing, they were making a vast amount of money because of the numbers involved. Everyone was paying to be there. And they'd use this information and pass it on. It was like this code of silence amongst them. And it eventually became known as the Crystal Silence League. And it was basically just a way of sharing internet uh, for stuff before, you know, pre-internet. Now, Alexander took these techniques he'd learned as a boy by overhearing stuff and realised that he could make more money doing um, mediumship than he could by being a magician. He still did magic as well. This is the weird thing. He did stage shows that combined traditional magic but also with the fortune-telling, with the, uh, the mind-reading, and he called himself a mentalist. Okay, so that's Alexander. Now... He reached a peak between 1914 and 1925. He reportedly earned four and a half million dollars. Right? That's, and that's in the money of that time. It's quite an incredible amount. And this was him. This is, I love this image of him. Now, the other thing about... Um, how can I put this? He was a bit of a boy. Um, he was married somewhere between seven and eleven times. He admitted to shooting between one and four men, depending on the occasion and how much he'd had to drink. He got arrested and imprisoned for extortion for trying to get $50,000 out of a businessman who he knew had cheated on his wife. In the Prohibition era, when alcohol was banned in the 30s, he'd retired by then, he became a rum runner. He used to have a speedboat and go up and down the coast of California transporting uh, alcohol from Canada down to America. He had a speedboat that did 70 miles an hour in 1932. Uh, he was into hunting, he was into fishing, uh, he was into photographing naked women. He, he, was, he was a man's man. Uh, the polite way of putting it, he was a real bastard. 
Um, it, the interesting thing about Alexander is the technology he used. Now, as early as 1915, he was using electronic technology on stage. Now, the interesting thing about this to me is that he was using the techniques of the, the fortune tellers, the cold reading, the applied psychology, but he had some interesting things in the, the theatre. I noticed here today there's a, a, like a glass bowl, like a fish bowl, just outside, and it's to put the questions in. He had exactly the same thing when he did shows. Uh, if you want to get a message from a departed loved one, just put your name, the name of the person who's departed, and this will get through to the spirit world. And the glass bowl will get taken backstage, and lo and behold, he'd read the minds of people and come up with these names, you know? It's not rocket science. Uh, but what he did, a, a really clever thing, he used to get information from the audience. It's known as pre-show work. Um, just basically finding information about people in the theatre before they'd even sat down. In 1915, he was using a hidden microphone in the frame of a mirror that he used to put in the ladies' toilets. So he'd carry around a mirror with him, put this in the toilets, the hidden microphone, he'd just overhear the conversation as they were coming in the theatre. So he'd get names. Oh, I'm here to see Alexander. What do you want to hear? I'd like to get a message from my Auntie Mary. I want to know how many children I'll have. Things like that. So he was using that. Now, the information was being fed to him in one of a couple of ways. One, he had a crystal ball on the stage, and it was on a, a small pillar, like a post. Uh, inside that post was a kind of like roller blind situation. There was someone underneath the stage who was writing on a long strip of paper and winding it. And this bit of paper was going inside the pole, up to the top, and passing underneath the crystal ball. So as Alexander looks in it, he's actually just reading this information from inside the crystal ball. Um, the far more technically advanced thing, he actually had a hidden earpiece. Now, have a look at the, the turban there. Right, on the right-hand side, you can see the turban. On the right of that, you'll notice that the right ear is slightly lower. Inside that, he actually had an early headphone a single headphone inside there. And what he was wearing on stage, his stage sets were very elaborate. He had big loads of Chinese and Indian silk curtains. He had rugs on stage and furniture. Inside the rug on the stage, he had a coil, a copper coil. And inside his turban, he had the headset with cable going down inside his clothes, going to coils in his shoes. And he was actually picking up as a radio transmitter in 1915 messages from backstage. He was wireless in 1915, basically, which is quite incredible. Uh, so this is sort of, you know, the ingenuity you have to admire. The morals, not so much so. So uh, this, this was Alexander. Now, as I say, he retired with plenty of money. Let me just read a thing. Um, this was from 1914, when he, one of the first times he got arrested and uh, the police were trying to find him. Um, he said, um, this is the district attorney, the legal guy in Chicago, saying about him. He is one of the most dangerous men in the business. The district attorney's office desires to warn women, especially, against his tricks. All his tricks and psychic demonstrations have, as a basis, some mechanical or chemical process. Danger lies in his operations through the Crystal Silence League, of which he is the head. The sole purpose of this league is to get the names and addresses of the credulous. He pretends to be a minister of the spiritual church and has fake ordination papers. And apparently when they did arrest him uh, in 1914, he, uh, the, uh, the bail they set him to, so he didn't have to go into prison was $7,500. Uh, he had the money on him at the time. He was carrying around more than $7,500. And so this is a guy who basically pretended to talk to the dead and made that amount of money. Now, this was the other thing to bear in mind about mediums and psychics is that they make the money at times when people are at their lowest. So another peak time was, you know, obviously you had things like the Boer War, uh, but the First World War, they really cashed in. So from 1914 to 1920, they were just making, raking money because people were losing their children, especially their sons during the war, and the parents back home who were generally older wanted to hear. So they were taking money. Now, around that time, this is when one of Alexander's pals, um, Houdini, uh, who trod the other path. Do you know who Houdini is? Yeah, he's, um, you know, he's probably the most famous kind of magician escape artist of all time. Uh, he died, oddly enough, on Halloween in 1926. Uh, but he was around the same time as Alexander. He was uh, trying to out the fake spirit mediums. Basically, he always wanted to believe that there was life after death and that you could communicate. And he also made various pacts. He made agreements with his friends that whoever died first, they would have a special code to come through. He never got that code. 
Um, he, you get the idea, because he was obsessed with his mother, that he actually wanted to believe in the spirit mediums. Um, and when he found out that they were mainly fakes, um, well, he didn't need to find out because he was one himself very early on. Uh, he spent a bit like myself, he actually spent a little bit of time being a fake medium. This post is actually later in his career when he actually started exposing them on stage, their various methods. Uh, but he used to get very angry about it uh, because he, he actually called mediumship the filthiest profession in the world. And he, he spent a lot of time, a lot of effort going in disguise to see fake mediums and then suddenly turning on a torch in the dark sounds. Uh, you know, he, he basically upset a lot of people. There are still some people that believe that when he got punched, he, he died as a result of uh, acute appendicitis after being punched several times. And some people think it was actually a plot by the spiritualists of the time to kill him. That's debatable. Uh, but Houdini was one of the major, major figures, uh, kind of the opposite of Alexander, you know, who, uh, and uh, so he's, he's a bit of a hero among sceptics. Um, I don't think it's any coincidence that James Randi in the United States, uh, you know, who's now the figurehead of the sceptical movement there uh, and exposes lots of mediums and fake psychics, also used to be an escape artist and magician kind of almost runs in the family. Uh, now, what I should mention about Houdini as well, uh, he had a particular run-in with a, a medium called Marjorie, Marjorie Crandon. Uh, there's a picture of her in the centre here. And they got mutual publicity. He did okay out of it because his show sold well. Um, but she uh, got very annoyed with him because he kind of exposed her several times and she was like the top medium in, a, uh, uh, in the States at the time, so making a lot of money. Um, they even went as far as building contraptions to stop her escaping. Uh, this was a box that he built for her to go in so that people could hold her hands and she couldn't move her head. Uh, they basically had a, a box with a very simple electrical switch which the spirit apparently used to ring to signal that they were there. So he built this box to stop her escaping, uh, to stop her doing it. And sure enough, when he'd fastened her in there, the, the materialisations didn't happen. And by the way, I've always thought that if spirits do appear in seances or elsewhere for that matter, they're pretty shit. Because basically, why would a spirit communicate by <laughs> that or by a faint glow in the dark? Why not poke someone really hard in the eye or something, you know? <laughs> it's like when a ghost appears. Like the ghost is never something really boring. People always say when they see a ghost, it's kind of like um, someone without a head or it's a Roman centurion or a, a child from a hundred years ago in chains. It's never someone who used to empty trash cans in 1978. You know, um, so it, it's a weird thing, but people want to believe, and I think this is the essence. As I say Houdini kind of went to his grave, uh, you know, having exposed lots of them. He got sued a lot of the time. He lost a lot of money legally, but basically nothing changed, and it still hasn't these days. Now, after the um, the First World War, and also after the 1920s, people still trying to communicate with their dead ones from the war. Um, things moved on a little bit then. Um, oh, this, this is what I meant to mention as well, uh, the, the ectoplasm idea. Ectoplasm, if you don't know, is supposedly leakage from the spirit world. It's some kind of almost liquid, some plasma that appears in the dark. When you see it with a flash photograph, not that impressive. Uh, to be honest. It's usually done with kind of a, a piece of fine cloth, gauze uh, or netting and sprayed very lightly with luminous paint. But you have to imagine that in the dark, someone pulling this out of their, their you know, uh, the, the top of their skirt or having it concealed in the mouth or wherever, uh, it would look very scary. You know, it's a real Ghostbusters thing. But when you see the reality of it, it's very mundane. But this kind of thing sort of died out after the 1920s. Now, when it got to, um, you know, probably the end of the Second World War, that's when things began to change. Uh, for one thing, in the 50s, uh, we had television. Now, television, certainly in, in Western Europe, really affected people going to see live shows. So every kind of live entertainment suffered. People just stayed at home, and the new curiosity, rather than seeing, you know, having a seance, would be watching the television. Um, what changed dramatically... Now, if you remember Alexander here... Um, he, his approach was uh, to be the exotic man of the Orient. All the images were kind of from India, China, Egypt, because people associated mystery and spirituality with uh, the Far East. What happened um, in the 1960s 
is people suddenly became very mundane. You know, like reality television today, it's all about ordinary people on TV. It's not about superstars anymore. And that's what happened in the medium world. And um, so, uh, next, basically what happened then, um, I think we've, we have this lady here in the UK, Doris Stokes. Now, Doris Stokes, in a sense, is very like, um, uh, is it Baba Vanga you had here? Uh, you know, it's kind of a similar figure. She was just an ordinary housewife from a poor background. Uh, she used to sit on stage in, in a chair. Uh, so this is her. But look at the size of the theatre. What she'd realised uh, after doing um, readings for people at home, one-to-one, -one, she could charge, you know, maybe 10 euro, 20 euro, whatever it may be, uh, to do a reading for one or two people. But if you play a, a theatre with 2,500 people in it, you can make serious money. But what she played was this sort of nice old lady who didn't really know what was happening, but she's using exactly the same te techniques as Alexander. Her idea of cold reading, if she was in a room like this, uh, she'd be coming out and kind of going, oh, I get the idea. Is there someone over here where the letter S means something? Right? And so the general idea, and this is where the cold reading comes in, someone would nudge their partner. So you go, get a, can I, I, is there a Susan or a Stephen or a Samantha? And of course there is, you know, it's two and a half thousand people. The, the odds are pretty much on your side. Uh, so she'd do this, then home in. Now, she also used what's called hot reading, which comes from the pre-show stuff. Hot reading is when you have information from before the show. And this was very clever. This is obviously before the days of the internet. What she used to do when she did the readings one-to-one, -one, she advertised in newspapers with, with a home phone number. Uh, she never answered the phone. Her husband answered the phone. And this was people from all over the country would phone in, and he'd go, I'm sorry, she's very busy at the moment, but can I take a few details and I'll get her to call you back? What's your name and where are you calling from? And what sort of thing do you want to, are you interested in talking about with her? He'd write down all these details. Go, OK, well, I don't think she can fit you in, but I'll tell you what, uh, next time we're in your area, we'll send you a couple of free tickets to the show so you can enjoy it. So, of course, these people go to the show and she goes, I've got uh, Celia. Um, she's 50, 53 years old. She has a cat called Ted. Uh, so, and she's got all the information from these people phoning her. Of course, the rest of the audience don't know this, so they think it's a miracle, you know? And uh, so she was around for, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 years, something like that, in the UK. Uh, meanwhile, we, we had lots of different people like that. There was someone called, also called Doris, Doris Collins. That's not her. And this, this guy here in the States, some of you probably know, this is Peter Popoff. Now, in the States, a slightly different thing was happening. It was less built around communicating with the dead and more about communicating with Jesus. Um, so there was a big evangelist thing movement there. So basically, people like this guy, Peter Popoff, which sounds like a made-up name, sounds like a Russian puppeteer. Um, Peter Popoff was doing uh, shows for 20 to 30,000 people in arenas. And he got busted. Basically, he used to say to people in the audience, you have cataracts down here, you're from Illinois, um, your name is David, uh, this person here has a bad back, it's a spinal injury, but you will walk. And he was basically being fed this information um, via an earpiece. Because what they were doing the same, uh, the, uh, before the show, the same as Alexander, you'd fill out a prayer card. Do you want us to pray for you? Get all these people, 20,000 people this evening, to pray for you. Fill in your name, your seat number. Tell us what you want to pray for. So he's got this information, and it was his wife was reading it to him backstage via a hidden earpiece. And once again, James Randi in America busted him. He got a radio scanner, and he picked it up, and he recorded it. And the, the stuff was really nasty as well. The things his wife was saying were really uh, racist, really nasty. And she's saying, the fat guy in the front row, yeah, the ugly one, he's got a bad back. And it was just really nasty stuff. And so this was released uh, into the press in America. And he actually confessed. This guy, he was a, a dollar billionaire. Peter Popov actually confessed all this gave his money away to a certain extent, or hid it, whichever, and, uh, and disappeared for a while. What we have now, uh, we're getting towards the end of the time, so I'm going to rush through these. These mediums that are working nowadays uh, are back almost to the originals, but they are very much that everyman approach. It's a bit like the, uh, the Baba Vanga, the Doris Stokes. They just appear like ordinary people. This guy is a multimillionaire in the States, uh, John Edward. He does big arenas, and it's the cold reading thing. It's the writing down the messages. In the UK, this is a funny guy, very camp guy, um, Colin Fry. Uh, he used to do more traditional seances at one time. Uh, he got busted. This is a photograph of him in the 70s with ectoplasm. 
That's, uh, but this guy has his own TV show in the UK. He got busted as well for doing the, uh, the trumpet thing. Someone, uh, uh, one of his seances, accidentally leant on a light switch and put the lights on. Uh, and it was, it was someone else's seance, but he was helping out. And as the lights came on, he was stood at the far end of the room on a chair, waving a trumpet in the air. <laughs> And he claimed that the spirits had lifted him, thrown him across the room onto a chair with a trumpet. So e even psychic news who believe it call him a charlatan. Uh, this guy is particularly nasty. Um, this is a guy, Joe Power, um, he's basically, uh, he's not very good actually, uh, at kind of cold ring and all the rest of it, but he just has some lucky hits. He got busted on a, on a UK TV programme where a magician called Darren Brown caught him out. He basically found out that he'd done a reading on a woman which sounded really good, sounded very accurate, but that woman turned out to live next door to his sister. <laughs> so he had the information. Have a look at this. What he does, and this is what I particularly dislike a lot of psychics uh, claim to do, is help the police with their inquiries. They claim that they can find murder victims, they, they suggest places that they can find a, a hidden body, who might have committed the murder. Doris Stokes claimed to have, find, uh, to have found a, a famous serial killer in the UK, did a drawing of him, looked nothing like him, wasted a lot of police time. This person here on the left is the mother of Shannon Matthews. You see on a t-shirt there, it's got, have you seen Sharon Matthews? Sharon Matthews was a young girl who uh, a couple of years ago in the UK was kidnapped. She went missing, people didn't know what happened, whether it was a paedophile ring, everybody, you know, it's one of those national TV things, everybody's wondering where she is. So Joe Power here uh, met up with her to help her, to find, you know, where, what had happened to Shannon. What we found out a few months after this photograph was taken is that Shannon Matthew was actually abducted as part of a plot set up by her own mother. Her own mother was guilty. So this is him, this is how much psychic knowledge he has He's kind of supposedly helping, well, all the time. It's the mother that did it, you know? Uh, and I find that particularly uncomfortable. This guy, Derek Akora, is a lot more funny. Uh, he's funny in a bad way because he has a very strong uh, working-class dialect. It comes from the Liverpool part of England. So he's got a very distinct way of speaking. Now, the person that advises him from the spirit world is a two-and-a-half-thousand-year-old uh, Egyptian um, called Sam. Uh, and bizarrely, when he goes into a trance and this communication comes from the other world via Sam, Sam has the same dialect as Derek, <laughs> which is very much a 20th century Liverpool dialect, a bit like the Beatles. Sam speaks like the Beatles, despite being a two and a half thousand year old Egyptian. Uh, this guy got caught out lots of times. He did a TV series called Most Haunted, which is just appalling. It's basically what they do, they just have one camera and it's set to infrared so you can record at night and they go into haunted houses. It's on something like season 19, they haven't seen a fucking ghost yet. <laughs> it's quite incredible. And yet, and, uh, this guy is the co-presenter of it, or was, until he fell out with the other presenter. The other presenter who did this show realised that he was getting all the attention you know, uh, people were coming up asking for his autograph and things like that. And so, basically, they set him up deliberately and they fed him some fake information. So, he was in this... He's, he's looking up on YouTube, Derek Akora. Um, basically, he uh, was in this place and he said it was owned by some Victorian gentleman called Creed Kafer. And he went into this trance and goes... And they, they start asking him, who are you? I'm Creed. I'm Creed Kafer. I'm Creed... Doing this really bad acting thing. In fact, that was better than he was. And... <laughs> Creed Kafer, it turns out, was actually an anagram. They'd switch around the letters, and what it actually spelt out was Faker Derek. <laughs> and he actually is there on... He's been caught out loads of time, but people still go and see him live. It was the same with the Davenport brothers, incidentally. I forgot to mention that earlier. They got exposed time and time again as using trickery, using magic tricks. And every time that happened, more people went to see it, to see if they could spot the trickery. So they made more money. It's incredible. <laughs> Peter Puffoff is back in business. Do you know what he's doing now? He's doing telesales evangelism. He's selling holy water, right? <laughs> Basically, you buy miracles. He did a thing for a while where he did debt consolidation. If you've got lots of debts, what you do is scrape together that last little bit of money, give it to him, and he will get people to pray. That will cancel all the other debt. I've kind of studied it a lot, and I don't believe that. You're more than welcome to believe it. But when people say about fortune tellers, which I'm guilty of, uh, things like that. They always say, but what harm does it do if it brings people a little bit of comfort? 
And the way I look at it, it's a bit like saying the same to a heroin addict, you know? Because what you're doing by pretending that the relative is actually contacting this person is giving them a little bit more, a bit more smack, a bit more heroin. Whereas actually going through bereavement is more like, like cold turkey. You ha it's horrible, it's hideous, but you have to go through it to get some kind of closure. Much though I hate that Americanism, you have to get closure on it. And when you're going to see a medium, what they're doing is destroying those memories of your loved one because they're creating false ones that never happened after that point. Um, the, you know, there's one story that kind of sums all this up where when I was going up to do these TV shows talking about Psychic Sally, I was, you know, it's five o'clock in the morning, I'm getting a train up to London thinking, do I really want to be doing this? I don't get paid for it, you know, um, apart from anything else. And um, I got this email from a, a, a Facebook friend who I didn't really know very well. He was a nurse, a male nurse. And he said, Paul, I just want you to know that a lot of medical people are behind what you're saying. He said, there's so many times when I've been with old people who've been victims of psychics because that's who they prey on. He said, there was an old lady a few weeks ago and she was, she was terminally ill. She couldn't have any more treatment. She knew she was going to die soon and she started crying. He said, I held her hand and said, are you okay? She said, I'm sorry, but I just realised that I've spent all of the money that I spent my life earning to pass on to my children, I've spent on these bastards. And it's in saying that, she actually died at that point with her holding his hand and him crying, you know? And a couple of weeks later, a vaguely similar thing, someone got in touch and said, um, there's a friend of mine who's very intelligent, he doesn't believe in psychic stuff generally, but his wife died, she was only 40, came out of the blue, she died, he was distraught. And so what you do is you clutch at straws. What can you do? You know, you can't bring them back, but if there's a slight chance you may be able to speak to them, you spend your money via a medium. So he did that, and the medium said, don't worry, everything will be fine. She's in heaven now, the pain's gone, and she's just waiting for you to join her. And the next week, he committed suicide to be with her. So that's the harm it can do. So rather than finish on that sort of down note, uh, I think what it really is about is about education. So if you have friends, or even if you go to see a psychic yourself, just look at it objectively. Because you get accused of having a closed mind if you don't believe in the paranormal. I think it's the opposite way around. We're prepared to believe that there isn't an afterlife, and I'm quite comfortable with that, you know? If someone can prove psychic ability, I'm open to that. But it hasn't happened yet, and I've been looking for it for a long time. There's been a, an offer of a million dollars in the United States to anybody that can prove psychic powers. That offer's been open for de uh, decades now. Um, this is also what you can do. You can, if you see a psychic show, and it will happen here. I know you don't usually get it in theatres, but it will happen, I guarantee. Just put a sticker on it that says cancelled due to unforeseen circumstances. Because <laughs> that makes them look shit. A few less people turn up, they make less money. That's the way to do it. But whatever you believe, and please, you know, don't, don't uh, think that I'm trying to tell you what you should think, it's just my experience, but I guarantee you one headline you will never see is this one, Psychic Wins Lottery Again. <laughs> should it not be obvious if you can predict the future and you can get information from the other side, why do none of them ever find buried treasure or win the lottery? You make your own mind up. Thanks very much.